Shalom, y'all. Spencer here, and welcome to Sound the Shofar, the quest for biblical truth. Today, we'll be introducing the shofar, where the idea of the podcast came from, where the name came from, shofaring with my puppy, and connecting the Messiah with the shofar. Ambitious? We'll see. It's time to sound the shofar. What a time to be alive. When I put out the first podcast, I had no idea that the world would have essentially shut down for a few weeks. So um, it's been an interesting time, eh? So um, <laughs> uh, I would have talked. I, I would talk more about the coronavirus and stuff like that. But um, let's be honest. Nobody wants to hear from me on that. I don't think um, they would rather see a puppy show far. So um, let's go ahead and start talking about the show far. All right. Um, I have brought up the show far in the past, and I've had a lot of friends that had no idea what exactly it is. So um, <clears throat> visually, it's it's just a, a horn of an animal. Um, it's been reshaped um, with heat, and uh, there's been things done to it to um, to make it to where it is a type of horn. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's got a little small end piece. The it's hollowed out on the inside. Um, I've got several to show you, and I I hope they'll you'll find them interesting. Um, I'm also going to play them just so you can hear the sounds, the difference in the sounds between the different ones. Um, this is a ram's horn, um, obviously coming from a ram. Um, and this one's a little smaller. I actually did have, uh, uh, when I first bought one of these on the internet, it was like the smallest one that they sell. And I didn't even think it worked because I tried to play it and nothing came out. Um, so I returned it to Amazon, but the odds are it probably was fine. I just had no idea how to play it. <laughs> um, but basically the smaller ones are actually much more difficult to play. So if you ever consider getting one of these, get a bigger one because it'll be easier um, and it took me a lot of practice just to get a sound out. Um, so when I play these, I hope the, it sounds right. Um, as not, my microphone's not designed for the frequency of this noise. Um, and I'm not that great at it myself. I'm hoping to get better, but we'll see. All right. So <clears throat> I'm gonna get some water. Okay, let's try this. <laughs> okay, so that one's a little smaller, still a little hard to play. Um, I'll get a larger ram's horn out. And you'll see it's a little easier to play. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's move on to a horn that is more common. Um... And actually, there are a couple other different types of shofars. I don't really know as much about those because they're really uh, a little more rare, except in maybe some Jewish sects or something. But um, the one that's actually more well-known than the ram's horn 
is this guy. So, um, yeah, it's hard to even, like, fit it in my shot unless I back away. Um, of course, I but a, I bought a gigantic one. Um, but this is from an animal called a kudu. Um, it's a type of antelope in East Africa. Um, a group of, of Jews, I forgot their um, historical name, but uh, they were based in Yemen, and so they're called Yemenite shofars. Um, whenever you look at videos of shofars or hear um, the shofar sound, most of the time they're pulling it from this guy. And there's a really good reason for that. Um, it sounds better or they're, they're easier to play. Um, you can get a, a wider array, a wider array of sounds. Um, and, and, and the truth is, is this is not the biblical shofar. When it's talked about in the scriptures, it is the ram's horn. Um, but it is still a type of horn that's from a clean animal, um, biblically speaking. And uh, because it sounds well, a lot of people use them. Um, and and I, I don't mind playing them. Um but whenever I want, like when I wanted the symbol for the podcast, I wanted a ram's horn. Um, I even thought about using one of these because it can kind of look like an S and you can get it to be. I was thinking about making like sound and shofar have the S's be shofars. Anyways, that's probably too much information. All right, let's, let's uh, take a listen to this guy. Okay, so, again, I'm not the best at this yet, um, nor is this easy to play, nor is my microphone designed for this. All right, <laughs> let's move on. So what are shofars used for? Maybe you've seen them, maybe you haven't. Um, you may think that there's only one use for them, but there's honestly many uses for the shofar. Um, everything from calling for alarm, the announcements for battle, um, calling people to gather, to remember certain um, um, pictures uh, in, that are used in Scripture, um, the biblical festivals. Uh, in fact, the probably the most well-known use for them um, is at Rosh Hashanah. Um, the biblical name is Yom Teruah, which means Day of Soundings. But on that day, which is the first of the seventh lunar month in the biblical calendar, um, generally it's in the September time frame, um, but varies... Uh, according to the Gregorian calendar, which we normally use. Um, so it's usually used on that day. And in fact, that day is in the Bible is usually translated the day of trumpets. Um, and, and it's essentially the day that a lot of noise was to be made. Um, and and so that's what a lot of people will know it for and, and what it was used for. Um, but there are definitely a lot of other uses as well. Um, so the shofar, um, it is a type of symbol. Um, and I want to use my puppy as an example. So let's check out a video of my puppy. <laughs> Good. 
I have to say, I have a pretty cool dog. <laughs> I love that dog. Um, honestly, I, uh, I wasn't a big fan of the idea of getting a dog. Um, that was all my wife's idea. Um, she wanted a bloodhound dog, um, with a, you know, red in color. And she saw this, this little puppy and is like, I've got to have it. And she convinced me that we should get it. I did. I wasn't too happy about it. It started biting us like all the time and pooping and peeing in the house. And then she changed her mind for a while. And, and like <laughs> I think there were a couple of days where she would have not cared less if that dog was gone. But he's he's moving. He's getting through that puppy stage and uh, he's gotten a little better. <laughs> but I'll just say um, the, sh the, the puppy in Howling is using his voice to create a large sound. And that's where we can get to a connection between the shofar and voice. And this is a biblical connection that I'll be able to show in a, a, a little later. I'm going to go through some of the biblical references to the shofar. But the idea that a small noise would, or, or the small vibrations would go through the tip of the horn and then reverberate throughout and then amplify what normally would be a quite small sound. Something about the shape of the horn creates an amplification of a small sound. I don't exactly know how that works, but I know it works. Um, so, you know, for example, when we look at the human anatomy, um, of which I know very little, even though I've been through biology classes and college and stuff, but I do know there's a little thing at the back of your throat that provides little vibrations and those vibrations amplify and then create a large sound. Um, and some people have deeper voices or louder voices um, based on how they can use it um, and even on their anatomy. Um, you know, for instance, why guys usually have deeper voices than girls. It's part of design. Um, and one of the reasons that I liked the name of the shofar in, in, in this podcast um, is because when I thought about it, this is really similar that through a small device that is a microphone, I can speak into this and it will amplify and go out into the world. And of course, in the digital world, I can record it once and then it it's just out there. Um, and so the idea of something small, that this one segment that I'm recording and, and playing in my home, that it can be heard throughout the world. So the idea of a shofar being this, you know, this device that uh, transforms a small sound into a large one um, seemed to be a fitting symbol for a podcast. I'm actually surprised I haven't heard it used before. Um, I don't think anyone else has a show named after a shofar. I could be wrong. I don't know. All that to say is that there's a relationship between the shofar the voice, and we'll be making a connection with the Messiah here in a little while, um, and and that's why it makes a lot of sense for a podcast. Okay, moving on to why did I start a podcast, or I say I, I should better say where did the idea come from? 
because it wasn't my idea. I didn't think about this. Um, it really came from my good friend Aaron Zavala. Um, he was visiting me in the city of Austin when I was studying Hebrew and Arabic there. Um, one day he we were talking and uh, walking and I was talking with about a lot of things that God had been moving in my heart and passages that I was wrestling with that I was seeing the Bible in a completely new light. Even though I've had years of technical training in the Bible and in tools to go deeper into the scriptures, I was finding there was a lot of things that I just hadn't heard before. And as I was talking with him about those, he was just like, dude, you need to start a podcast. Which I was like honored that he would say something like that because, you know, why would anyone want to hear from me? I don't feel that special. <laughs> I just don't. Um, and over time, I felt that um, it would be necessary. I was finding that I was having a lot of conversations over the same things over and over and over again with people. And I was finding that a lot of the things that I was talking about, people hadn't heard of before. Um, I mean, just as an example, the shofar. I was talking with a good friend um, the other day, and he was like, so what's a shofar? <laughs> and I was like, well, I have a whole podcast now devoted to it. Um, <laughs> but but it's it's... it's I mean, he's been a Christian for most of his life, and and I would say even for me until uh, just a few years ago, I wouldn't have known what it is what it was either. So, um, but I've discovered that there's a lot of really cool things about the shofar that can help inform our understandings of the scriptures better. So. There are things like this that I found it was. It would be a useful tool to have a podcast and to talk about these things that um, not a lot of churches or pastors have necessarily talked about. So here we are. Um, I got the idea for the name from my father-in-law, and I don't think he even knows this, um, but my wife and I were watching a clip um, from his YouTube, not YouTube, his Facebook channel, um, during the festival of Sukkot. And so, um, I'm going to go ahead and play that clip here, um, real quick. I just wanted to give everybody a quick tour of the place. Uh, we're getting set up. We're about to eat. After we eat, we'll sign back on and, uh, sound the shofar and begin Sukkot. Have a great afternoon. Talk to you soon. I was struggling to find a name for this podcast for some time. I liked the symbol of the shofar, but I, I couldn't find a name that would fit. You know, I even thought about um, shofar so good or shofar show good. Um... Oh, what were some other ones? I don't know. Anyways, the, uh, they were they were kind of corny, and I couldn't figure out something that fit. And my my wife and I were watching um, that video with um, uh, Mr. Steve Martin. Um, our it was my wife's, obviously my wife's father and pastor, um, and their church was celebrating the. Uh, festival of Sukkot, which is um, commonly known as the Festival of Tabernacles. Um, so they were celebrating this, and we were we were watching. And when he said that they were going to sound the shofar, I was just like, "Yes, that's it, that's it." Um, so sound the shofar was born. <laughs> All right. 
Um, all right, what next? <laughs> okay, yeah. All right, so where'd he get the idea from? I mean, did he just, like, think that the show far was cool? Um, I mean, I think it's cool. But um, he got it from the Bible. Um, and more specifically, the festival that he was using it in, uh, it calls for and requires the use of the shofar as part of it. Um, so I thought it'd be cool to, to, to do a general survey of a lot of the uses of the shofar in the Bible. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pull some of these guys up. <clears throat> First, I want to go to Exodus... Oops. Exodus 19. All right. So this is the first use of the shofar in the Bible. Um, and, and so that should give some significance to um, why it might be so useful. So let's check it out. Um, in Exodus 19, um, this is a passage in which um, the Israelites were uh, camped before Mount Sinai. They had already left Egypt. Um, They're about to receive the Ten Commandments. And um, a passage that not a lot of people talk about is leading up to the Ten Commandments, what happened so I'm going to go ahead and just read it. So um, uh, let's have, I'll have you read along. Um, whoops, I thought it was up. There we go. Okay. In the third month, from the very day the Israelites left the land of Egypt, they came to the Sinai wilderness. They traveled from Rephidim, came to the Sinai wilderness, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Moses went up to the mountain to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession. And out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine... And you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. After Moses came back, he summoned the elders of the people and set, them befo set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. Then all the people responded together, We will do all that the Lord has spoken. So Moses brought the people's words back to the Lord. Okay, time out. All right, so this is a, a passage in which God is giving his covenant terms to the people and, and, and why he brought them out. He's calling them to be a unique people, and he's going to give them special requirements for them to follow in order to be in covenant with him. Um, and they voluntarily say, okay, let's do it. Um, all right, so he, th we'll pick up from there. <clears throat> Verse 9. The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear when I speak with you and will always believe you. Um, so he wants everybody to see this. <laughs> Moses reported the people's words to the Lord. And the Lord told Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. They must wash, wash their clothes and be prepared by the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put boundaries for the people all around the mountain and say, be careful that you don't go up on the mountain or touch its base. Anyone who touches the mountain must be put to death. No hands may touch him. Instead, he will be stoned or shot with arrows and not live. Whether the animal or human 
When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they may go up the mountain. Hmm. So we see that the ram's horn already here is being used as the welcoming to the mountain. Hmm. All right, verse 14. The Moses came down from the mountain to the people and consecrated them, and they washed their clothes. He said to the people, Be prepared by the third day. Do not have sexual relations with women. Pause. This means he was serious. You know, no no playing around. This is serious time. Okay, <clears throat> verse 16. This is where it gets cool. On the third day, when morning came, there was thunder and lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain, and a very loud trumpet sound. So far. So that all the people in the camp shuddered. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke because the Lord came down on it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in the thunder. All right, we're going to go ahead and stop there. Um... The sound of the trumpet, this um, this word here is shofar. Um, and what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to pull this uh, up in Hebrew um, and show something that's going on here. <clears throat> All right, so here where it says, um, as the sound of the trumpet, um, the shofar, um, grew louder or more strongly, very strongly. And Moses spoke and Elohim, God answered him with a voice. Now here it's translated thunder. But what I'd like to point out in that, even if you don't know Hebrew, um, this word kol and this word vakol or by voice, um, it is definitely the word for voice. It is not the normal sound. It's not the normal word for um, making sound. It's voice. So here it's the voice of the shofar grows louder. Um, and then that God answers by voice. Hmm. Um, I don't know if there's definitely some sort of connection here between the shofar and God's voice. Um, they're being played off of each other in, um, I don't know if it's necessarily a pun, but it's meant to show that there's a connection. Um, let's look at it in another translation. Um, this is uh, the Tree of Life version. Um, and in that verse it says, when the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with a thunderous sound. Um, you know, I don't know what that sound sounded like. Here is saying thunderous, but, um, you know, unless my, my Hebrew is not that great, um, that passage doesn't say thunder. Um, at least not the Hebrew I'm looking at. All right, that aside, <clears throat> right after this... Um, is when the Ten Commandments are introduced. So all like this amazing um, experience, this is all happening at the mountain right when he's about to give the Ten Commandments. Um, and the shofar was used to amplify um, a sound's Throughout the whole area, and there's thunder and lightning. I mean, they probably thought they were going to die when they met him. Because it says that they all saw him. Um, and that they were, and after this they were like, okay, 
um, Moses, why don't you go and talk with him? We, we can't, we can't do this. Um, so I'll let's say there's a connection here between the voice of God, the entrance of God, and the shofar. And this is the very first use of it. So I'm going to do a Bible word study on the shofar. Um, let me bring this over here, close that out. All right, so this is a really cool function in Logos um, where I can pull up a Hebrew word and then see how a particular translation chose to use it. And then I can just see all the different passages that it comes up. Um, so here are the first couple are Exodus 19 um, and Exodus 20 talking about when they saw um, the thunder and lightning, the sound of the shofar, um, the mountains surrounded by smoke, um, all that's there. Um, the next one, Leviticus 25, you're to sound a trumpet, a shofar loudly in the seventh month. Um, that was, uh, that was not the one I was mentioning earlier. This one is specifically, um, on the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. Um, that's the 10th day of that lunar month. Um, the, a famous one that most everyone's heard of at some point is Joshua 6. So I'm going to go ahead and go to that. Uh, here in Joshua 6, verse 8. Um, After Joshua had spoken to the troops, seven priests carrying seven shofars before the Lord moved forward and blew the shofars. The Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. While the trumpets were blowing, the armed men went in front of the priests who blew the trumpets, the shofars, and the rear guard went behind the Ark. But Joshua had commanded the troops, Do not shout or let your voice be heard. Don't let one word come out of your mouth until the time I say, Shout. Then you are to shout. Let's go ahead and skip ahead a few verses. Go to verse 20. So the troops shouted, and the trumpets sounded, the shofars. When they heard the blast of the shofar, the troops gave a great shout, and the wall collapsed. The troops advanced into the city, each man straight ahead, and they captured the city. Um, so this is this really famous story very clearly connects the shofar with shouting. Let's go back to our little survey. Um, most of these are from Joshua 6. Um, Judges 7. Uh, I won't go to this example, but this is where Gideon has the 300 troops, and um, they had um, essentially stone, not stone, um, uh, pottery like things in, their, in one hand and then a shofar on their other. Um and they also had swords. But there's three, only 300 of his army, and they surrounded um, the encampment there. Um, and they blew the shofars. And everyone was going crazy, and they started killing each other. And then um, Gideon's army went in to wipe them out. Um, so it's just <clears throat> another example where... Um, the voice, because the the men were shouting and blowing the shofars. So there's some sort of connection there with um, the voice and the trumpet. Now, I could go to a ton of different examples that are used in the Bible. Um, Psalms uh, talks about the trumpets, the shofar. Um, so it is a... a, a, a um, instrument used in worship. Um, Isaiah talks about, um, a shofar being blown and <clears throat> those lost in the land of Assyria will come. Um, some people think this is the lost Israelites. That's a whole nother thing. We'll get to another day. <clears throat> um, so anyways, it's used a lot and I could go to so many of these, um, but there's actually a insinuation, a um, 
a use of the shofar before it was a shofar. Um, here's what I mean. Let's go to Genesis 22. <clears throat> this is a very, very famous passage. Um, and uh, what I want to show here is um, the story with um, Abraham and Isaac. Here in Genesis 22, um, the sacrifice of Isaac, um, this story is extremely famous and connects the shofar with this story, even if you didn't notice it. All right, so um, I'm going to skip forward <clears throat> and look and see what kind of happens towards the end. Um, so Abraham, he had this, um, this command from God to sacrifice his son. He goes with his son to the mountain that he had been told to go to. Um, he puts the wood on his son and the text says, um, his one and only son, which, um, is an interesting, um, choice of words because he actually had another son so and that was ishmael um we'll get to that in a second um so he goes up with uh with isaac he's about to um sacrifice him um even the wording of the binding of isaac uh, makes it sound like isaac was willingly going there um but this whole scenario is a picture of what would happen one day with Jesus, um, that you have the one and only son, um, the one that's been chosen, the one that willingly goes, he places the wood on his back, um, he goes up the mountain, um, and is sacrificed there, and the Bible, well, it can be argued from the Bible, but at least Jewish tradition does state that those places, Mount Zion um, and this place in the story with Isaac, are the same place. So you have him being sacrificed at the same, same place, um, except Isaac had something else there. He expected a lamb. He asked his father when they were going up the mountain, Hey, Dad, where's the animal for the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb. Uh, here's God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Um, and instead what we see is that there's a ram. Say verse 12, this is Genesis 22, verse 12. Then he said, Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. Again, your only son. Um, I won't really go into that today much, but it's interesting that he would say it that way when physically he did have another son. And there's a reason for that. Um... Well, Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So he went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. That's really interesting. Um, and I've got a little story here, and I, I'll share this again at some point. Um, but I was at a Jewish learning center. And I was there on Rosh Hashanah, um, the Day of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, whatever you know it by or don't know it. That's in the fall. Um, on that day I was that I was there, they were connecting this story and the ram's horns being caught in the thicket. They're connecting that with the entrance of the Messiah coming on that day on Rosh Hashanah. 
I was really intrigued how they came to that understanding, but they believe that the shofar has a connection with the Messiah. Um, and when I heard that and I looked at this, I was like, well, I believe that that was talking about the Messiah. Most Christians do. It's really an obvious type connection that the Bible makes, um, and is quite clear. Um, and that helps fuel my interest in the shofar, um, that there's a connection between them. And that brings us to our next passage. Um, and this one is First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. In this passage, Paul is writing to the Thessalonians and trying to give them some hope. Um, and so let's go ahead. Verse 13. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we say this to you by a word from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, there's a whole lot I can talk about this passage, um, and I will at some point, especially when I get more into... Um, what's going to happen when the Messiah comes back? What's going to happen when Jesus returns? Well, this passage is used a lot for that, um, and I can talk about that more in depth another time. What I do want to point out is that his return is connected with the trumpet of God. Well, what, what is that? When you look at the passage in Exodus 19, that shofar was not a human shofar. It was not one that anyone else was playing because it got loud, really loud. Like, they were terrified. You know, there's thunder, lightning, a shofar that's really loud that... Uh, like two million people could hear when they weren't next to the mountain. They they go up there and then it gets louder and louder and louder. So that was not a normal shofar. In fact, you could argue that the um, the ram's horn is a symbol of God's shofar. That's something to think about. Um, and here in this passage, it says, so the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. So again, the voice with the archangel's voice. I'm not necessarily sure what that exactly means, but I'm sure it's loud. And with the trumpet of God. So this is there. This is that I believe a shofar at his return. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Um, So we have this connection between the Messiah's return, his identity, um, and the human voice, God's voice. Like everything, there's there's all these connections here. And um, if you've never heard of... Uh, this trumpet being a shofar, you may not see those connections. Um, And it's something I thought was really fascinating that um, I would want to bring up. Um, And the last thing I want to say with this is um, I'm going to share a story that I was preaching on this um, at my old job. Um, I was a Bible teacher 
at a little Christian school south of Dallas. Um, and I brought my shofar um, as an example for people to play. And um, I, my students came up and tried to blow it and no sound came out. Or it just sounded really, really bad. Worse than me. But um, it was pretty humorous. And um, when I when I when I when I went out with the middle schoolers, um, I played a uh, this shofar clip that I had found that was really cool. Um, and I, I played it and then walked up, and I'd never really thought about it, but um, the junior hires thought it was like my walkout song, so. Um, they, they stood up and gave me the standing ovation. Um, we're like screaming. Um, it was, it was hilarious. Um, <laughs> but it, they, they considered it like my walkout song, almost like a fight, fight song. Well, that got me to thinking later. This is God's walkout song. When Jesus comes back, he's going to walk out. He's going to come to the sound of a shofar that goes throughout the whole world, um, and that's his return. And that is awesome. And I, I wanted to share that with you guys. I thought it was so cool. I hope you enjoyed that, like seeing that there's a connection between the voice, the shofar, the messiah. Um, even my puppy likes the shofar. Um, I hope you all like and you like that. Um, all right, till next time. If you enjoy this episode, please share it with friends and family. Um, I have big plans for this podcast, but really, it's just here to help you. Uh, I want to help you in your search for truth. Um, if you have something like a passage that you'd like for me to investigate, let me know. I'll keep that in mind and be able to use it in the future. Um, Sound the Shofar is here to investigate scriptural truth. So remember, hear the word, see the truth, make it so. It's time to show. <laughs> Remember, hear the truth. All that to say. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. <clears throat> so, um, where do we get the eye? Uh, wh- Let me take a step back. Um, shofaring with my puppy and... Ha <laughs> ha.